Are you a scammer? Do you hate scammers? Hi, my name is Matt, and I'm a legacy scammer. If you've come for an expose of magic fraud, counterfeits, or cheating, consider yourself scammed. Scammed by me into learning about legacy. So let's delve into what scam is now, where it came from, and every scam deck in Legacy right now. We'll begin by defining scam. In Magic the Gathering, scam refers to a strategy of exploiting the Modern Horizons 2 pitch elementals, specifically by cheating them into play for one mana and getting their Enter the Battlefield ability twice. Fury, Grief, and to a lesser extent Solitude are the creatures used for this strategy. In Modern, this was achieved with an effect like Undying Evil or Not Dead After All. These would be cast in response to the Sacrifice trigger on a Grief or Fury when they were evoked. In Legacy, we have a much more potent tool, Reanimate. The play pattern of this synergy begins by evoking Grief by pitching a black card from hand, then reanimating the Grief. This results in a 3-2 with Menace and double thought seizing the opponent for a total investment of 3 cards, 1 mana, and 4 life. The scam effect isn't oppressively powerful for Legacy, but it is highly mana efficient, and each of these cards are powerful enough to play in a standalone fashion. Reanimate also opens up the door to play an additional synergy with Troll of Khazad-dûm. The basic land type cyclers from Lord of the Rings are playable in their own right, with both Lorien Revealed and Troll of Khazad-dûm seeing play. Troll, in combination with Reanimate, enables us to present a card-neutral 6-5 with Super Menace for only 2 mana and 6 life. First, we cycle the Troll for a Swamp or a Black Dual Land, then we reanimate it. Reanimate, Grief, and Troll make up the core of what we call the Scam Package when we're talking about it in Legacy. As an extension of this package, I typically consider Orcish Bowmasters and Wasteland to be components of this core when it's found in fair and hybrid decks. The Grief Reanimate Troll core can be found in many decks that fall into one of three categories. These three categories are Demir Scam decks that play a fair, midrange, or tempo game plan, black-based aggressive, stompy, or prison decks, and dedicated reanimator decks with big creature payoffs. Let's start with the least fair Grief deck, Reanimator. Reanimator has been around forever in Magic and it shares the fewest commonalities with the other Legacy Scam decks. The first reanimation spell ever printed was Animate Dead, all the way back in Alpha, and to this day, it's still one of the best ever printed. Reanimator is a deck that tries to put large creatures like Gristlebrand, Archon of Cruelty, or Atraxa Grand Unifier into the graveyard. This is done with cards like Careful Study, Entomb, or Faithless Looting. Once that first step is complete, a reanimation effect like Reanimate, Exhum, or Animate Dead is used to put that creature back into play. For much of the history of Legacy, Demir was the preferred color combination among reanimator players. This provided interaction via counter magic and added stability from the use of cantrips. In the more recent past, more reanimator lists have shifted from being fully two color Demir decks to being primarily mono black with a very light red splash for Faithless Looting. Compared to their Demir counterparts, these decks are much more explosive and proactive. I think it's important to examine the role of the scam package in this deck. Grief is similar, but distinctly different from Unmask, a card that was already being played in Reanimator. Unmask disrupts the opponent, but can also be used to target yourself, discarding a threat for immediate reanimation. Once Grief was printed, and we learned how good it is when combined with Reanimate, which just so happens to be a core component of the deck anyways, it was quickly included in Reanimator. Grief can only discard your opponent to remove their counterspell or their interaction, but it does have additional utility with Reanimate, and it can apply some onboard pressure. The Grief package provides the ability to apply a little bit of pressure, giving a marginal but impactful alternate game plan. Dedicated Reanimator has been the most played deck with the scam package in it in Legacy over the past year or so, I think this is due to it being powerful, but still relatively affordable, so it's a good entry point for new Legacy players. The typical reanimator list these days consists of a core of enablers and payoffs. Playsets of Entomb and Faithless Looting are the enablers which put a payoff creature into the graveyard to be reanimated. The payoffs typically consist of playsets of reanimate and then a combination of 4-8 to eight copies of some combination of animate dead and or exhum. The threats we reanimate have a pretty wide range. 
but are most commonly Archon of Cruelty, Atraxa Grand Unifier, and Grizzlebrand. We often see one of targets for specific situations that can be fetched with Entomb. These silver bullets include cards like Sire of Insanity, Iona Shield of Emeria, Galta Stampede Tyrant, Ashen Rider, and very occasionally, very very occasionally, Tidespout Tyrant. Many lists play playsets of Lotus Petal and Dark Ritual to maximize the number of games where a turn 1 reanimation play is possible. Fast mana and initial mana sources have a level of tension to examine when looking at stability versus speed in deck construction. The more acceleration played, the fewer lands are likely going to be desired in order to avoid flooding out on mana producers. The cost of this is that it increases the number of hands where a Lotus Petal is the only initial mana source, or where there isn't an initial mana source at all, meaning that playing a longer game is much harder if not impossible. The rest of the deck is typically comprised of playsets of Grief, Unmask, and some number of copies, usually 2-4 copies of Thoughtseize, and 0-3 copies of Troll of Kazadoom. Apart from Troll, these all serve as mana-efficient ways to force through a reanimation spell or to protect a threat from a removal spell. The mana base is usually 13 to 16 lands, with some number of swamps and fetches, a couple bad lands, and sometimes 1 to 2 dual lands that help pay splash color costs for sideboard cards. We'll touch on sideboards in a moment. Reanimator is a great choice for you if you're looking for a compact, fast combo with the redundancy to attempt reanimation multiple times in a single game. The primary reason to avoid the deck is that it's pretty vulnerable to graveyard hate out of the sideboard. It is very one-dimensional in the main deck, not giving you many options on how to approach a matchup or a situation. The other downside is that sometimes the reanimation effect is not game-ending. Control decks can grind through an Atraxa or an Archon even once it hits play, and combo decks can sometimes fully ignore that threat and assemble a kill through that anyways. During pre-board games, Reanimator is possibly the fastest and most consistent deck in the format. Entomb into Reanimate is one of the most card and mana compact combos available in Legacy. To present a turn 1 reanimation, all we need is Entomb, Reanimate, a land or a lotus petal, and a piece of acceleration. We can present Reanimate and still have 3 cards remaining from a 7 card hand with which to disrupt or to attempt to reanimate again. This is where Grief and Unmask really shine. Having a 0 mana discard spell allows the deck to play through a single force of will very easily. Thoughtseize also functions as an additional piece of interaction here, allowing for the same kind of aggressive lines on turn 1 off of an extra piece of fast mana or a leftover mana from a dark ritual. Land into Dark Ritual, Thoughtseize, and Tomb Reanimate is one of the spookiest things that can happen in Legacy. I know, it's happened to me far too many times. Unlike our other grief decks, the scam package here is included simply due to synergy rather than adding an entirely new dimension to the deck. Although the scam package significantly aids the post-board beatdown plan, should you decide that that's the right path. Depending on card choices, Reanimator has typically strong combo mirror matches due to being more compact and efficient, and being full of discard spells. The Demir Reanimator decks have especially strong combo matchups due to being both fast and having access to counter magic. Stompy style decks are also relatively strong matchups. It's pretty difficult to race a Reanimator player, so these matches often revolve around mulliganing 2 and then sticking a lock piece. Something like a Chalice of the Void, Unlicensed Hurst, or Leyland of the Void. On the other hand, tempo decks like Delver are really tough matchups for Reanimator. Their fast clock backed up by Days and Force of Will is a time-tested way to beat combo. Life total matters. Resolving Reanimate can cost 6 to 8 life, so being pressured and then casting Reanimate can lead to getting burned out with Lightning Bolts if you're not careful. In these tempo matchups, even though Reanimator can assemble the combo multiple times in a game, they may not have time or life to present it more times than the opponent can interact. Control decks can also be relatively poor matchups. They don't have the ability to pressure quickly the way that Tempo can, but they have many tools to prevent reanimation, and their long game engines and removal spells allow them to grind through multiple successful reanimation attempts, attacking the deck on multiple non Tempo axes. This is especially true for Swords to Plowshares control decks, as Exile Removal prevents reanimating the target once it's removed. Both Tempo and Control decks have counter magic to protect permanent pieces of Graveyard Hate, something like an Unlicensed Hurst or a Leyland of the Void. This combination could be exceedingly difficult to win through. Non-blue midrange and lands-based strategies 
are typically strong matchups as well, so they're often too slow to race, and they don't have counter magic to interact with. The primary deck building decision in the main deck is anchored on the axis of speed versus resiliency, and what trade-offs are made in order to achieve the balance between these two depends on what you prefer. I think the clearest example of this is Chancellor of the Annex. Chancellor makes explosive lines much harder to interact with, but this comes at the cost of being a much lower impact card as the game continues. Other examples of this include Unmask vs. Thoughtseize, with the prior being much more effective on early turns. Deciding to play a blue version with Ponder and Brainstorm provides the ability to play a much more stable long game, but these require mana investment, inherently slowing the deck down. Blue versions typically also include Force of Will and Daze, which can provide additional resiliency versus opposing graveyard hate, but they are reactive cards that do not allow you to be as explosive as you would otherwise be. Some players have recently been experimenting with Worldly Tutor plus the new Surveil lands. This choice also falls on the sort of speed versus resiliency spectrum. This interaction allows you to put a Surveil trigger on the stack and then respond with a Worldly Tutor, putting your payoff on top of the deck to then mill when the Surveil trigger resolves. In effect, it is a slightly clunkier version of the best card in the deck, Entomb. This gives a lot of additional redundancy, but it effectively costs 2 mana, 1 for Tutor, and 1 for the opportunity cost of putting the land into play tapped. Reanimator has one of the widest ranges in sideboard cards played of almost any deck, and sideboard construction is one of the most meaningful decisions to make when playing Reanimator. Beyond the expected interaction for opponent's game plans, we also have an additional dynamic to consider. The most pressing issue to solve in post-board games is not how do we prevent our opponent from executing their game plan, instead, it's how will our opponent try and stop us from enacting our game plan. Beating Graveyard Hate is a balance between being proactive and reactive. Reactive plans include cards like Serenity, Boseju, and Prismatic Ending to remove hate pieces like Grafdigger's Cage and Leyland of the Void. Removal spells are often a supporting piece here that can both buy time and remove creatures that interact with the graveyard, creatures like Containment Priest or Delphi Voidwalker. Proactive plans typically involve shifting gears by boarding in a non-graveyard-based strategy to beat the graveyard hate simply by ignoring it. There are many transformative sideboard packages that can be played. Changing the combo entirely into a Witherbloom Apprentice and Chain of Smog package is one of the most popular plans right now. Alternatively, transforming into a beat-down scam deck with Orcish Bowmasters, Doughty Voidwalkers, and Opposition Agents is another option, one that happens to play very well with the main deck griefs. Apart from those two, Show and Tell has been a popular and compact package for a while, allowing you to just bypass the graveyard entirely, putting a reanimation target into play, and some lists even go so deep as to play Doomsday with Thassa's Oracle as their win condition. Reanimator is a great deck if you like playing something that is fast and powerful, but don't mind dealing with powerful sideboard cards that are very potent against you, or enjoy the transformative sideboard subgame. The deck likely isn't for you if interaction and grind games are your preference, and blowout sideboard cards put you on tilt. If Reanimator seems like it might be up your alley, but you want something with slightly better results, stay tuned for another deck later on. Let's look at the black-based aggressive scam decks. There are many iterations of an aggressive, fair grief deck. These lists are the closest relatives we have of the modern scam deck from last fall. Mono Black Aggro Scam has been the most popular of these decks for the better part of the last 12 months. The core of these decks are comprised of the scam package of Grief, Reanimate, and Troll of Kazadoom. The supporting creature suite contains Orgish Bowmasters, Delphi Voidwalker, and often Opposition Agent. In the remaining core slots, we usually see Thought Seizes, Removal Spells, and then a mana base that includes Wasteland. How the rest of the deck is constructed delineates which of the subcategories of Black Base Scam we're looking at. On the fair end of the spectrum, this package is found in Mono Black Aggro, Rakdos Scam, and Orzov Scam. On the unfair end, there are a few hybrid decks, Helm Combo, Witherbloom Combo, and Riscaminator. Across all of these, the scam package functions to apply pressure and disrupt the opponent. Mono Black Aggro is probably the purest form of the black-based scam deck. This deck is trying to get you dead ASAP, trading long game resiliency for relentless aggression. The creature suite typically contains playsets of Stalactite Stalker, Orcish Bowmasters, and Opposition Agent. The scam creatures and a couple of copies of Shieldred fill out the creature threats. 
Removal consists of a combination of Shieldred's Edict, Fatal Push, Snuff Out, and Murderous Cut. Playsets of Thoughtseize, Dark Ritual, and Reanimate round out the remainder of the non-land cards. The mana base consists of a playset of Wasteland, 4-8 Black Fetchlands, and 7-8 or eight Swamps. In the sideboard, we see Leyland of the Void and Fairy Macabre as Graveyard Hate. There's Null Rod for Artifact decks. We also see a few creatures with high levels of utility. Plague Engineer for opposing Bowmasters or small creature decks, and Torak for grindier mid-range and control matchups. Supplementing this, Feed the Swarm, Powder Keg, and Shieldred's Edict are additional removal spells to round out the main suite in some specific matchups. Mono Black Aggro is great at applying pressure quickly, and combines discard with fast, disruptive threats to keep the opponent off balance and attack their bottlenecks. Most of the threats double as lock pieces, Bowmasters, Taxes Cantrips, often eliminating the ability for the opponent to cast something like Brainstorm at all, except in emergencies. Dalthy Voidwalker is a Leyland of the Void that has additional upside of putting your opponent's cards under the Void and then being able to cast them for free later. Finally, Opposition Agent prevents the opponent from searching their library with fetch lands or tutors. The deck is very proactive, as every non-land is either a threat or a removal spell. Dark Ritual and Reanimate are both tools that enable playing well above curve. Reanimating a Troll of Cosidoom or Grief, or ritualing out a 2-3 drop like Opposition Agent or Orcish Bowmasters, are all extremely mana efficient plays. As a monocolor deck, the mana base is incredibly stable and resilient to Wasteland and other non-basic land hate cards. Lacking cantrips or other smoothing cards, the deck is incredibly dense, with nearly half of the 60 cards being threats. These upsides do come at a cost, however. The primary downside is being reliant on the composition of cards drawn. Lacking cantrips or other selection elements, this deck is prone to flood or screw. As a monocolor non-blue deck, the options for interaction are limited. Lacking blue means that there's a minimal amount of turn zero interaction that can be played against combo. Then there are very powerful sideboard cards available in other colors, cards like Meltdown, Pyroblast, and Collector Oof. Mono Black Aggro Scam is aggressive and disruptive, but it does require strong sequencing. The Scam Package provides info regarding threat sequencing, as each card in the primary threat suite has a passive ability that can encumber the opponent. Each of these creatures creates friction for different cards and different decks, with Discard providing the information to best leverage the correct tool at the correct time. However, if the opponent has two pieces of removal, it can often be better to sandbag the important threat until they've spent the removal on the less important threat, knowing that the more important threat will end the game if we can resolve it. Often an opponent surviving an initial wave means that other decks will outcard Mono Black in the long game either via card quality, quantity, or selection. If we look at the threats in the deck without their static abilities, they're kind of small and inefficient. This means that the static ability is deeply important to the functioning of this deck. Some decks, like Moonstompy, Goblins, and Rhinos, can just ignore the abilities of these creatures and focus on executing their primary game plan. I think the main deck is pretty set at this point, but players have explored different mana base options, and we still see them from time to time. Sometimes we see Ancient Tomb and Urza Saga lists. This increases the power level significantly, but at the cost of the mana base being less able to produce black mana, resulting sometimes in mono-colored color screw, which is a lovely sentence to say. I've also seen lists with Lotus Petal or Chromox. This gives the deck more explosive power, but at the cost of long game stability. Additionally, non-dark ritual fast mana is easier to play around. Leaving up a single black mana can represent Opposition Agent or Orcish Bowmasters at instant speed off of a dark ritual, forcing opponents to decide what to play around. The removal suite likely has the most flexibility of choice here. Efficient removal like Fatal Push or Snuff Out, balanced with broader answers like Shieldred Edict, those are my preference when looking at these decks, but you can play whatever combination of removal spells your heart desires. Many players opt out of playing broader answers like Shieldred's Edict, leaving them cold to something like a Merit Lage or a Troll of Cause of Doom. Mono Black Aggro Scam is a fantastic budget legacy deck. It has a great track record on the highly competitive Magic Online metagame, where many players are choosing Mono Black Aggro even though they could afford other decks and have the ability to play something else. It's a great choice for players who like aggression, sequencing, and playing on a razor's edge. You should likely avoid this deck if you want tools to answer any situation, enjoy cantrips and counterspells, or if you lean towards go big decks. Now that we've examined reanimator and black based aggressive scam decks, let's examine the final category of scam based decks. 
Demir-based scam decks all combine the proactive scam package with a reactive and stable blue shell comprised of Force of Will, Daze, Ponder, and Brainstorm. Compared to the mono black or heavy black lists, Demir Scam typically trades off threat density and acceleration for a wider variety of interaction spells and mid to late game stability via card selection. One of the biggest weaknesses of discard spells in general is that they can't interact with the top of the opponent's deck. Your opponent will always draw the best card possible, and you die. Forceful and Days provide ways to interact with the opponent drawing that must answer threat. Brainstorm and Ponder allow the deck to find the right number of spells and lands as the game progresses, mitigating the possibility of drawing too many or too few lands. These decks often fill the role of a tempo to control deck depending on the situation and texture of the draw. As with the black aggro lists, there are many flavors of Demir Scam decks. We've got Classic Demir Scam, a more aggressive version playing Delver, there's a Hogak Scam deck, Demir Scaminator, and Salt Ice Scam. I like to think of Classic Demir Scam as the parent of the Demir Scam category. It isn't as popular now as it once was, but most of the other Demir Scam decks evolved out of this original shell. The classic version of this archetype relies primarily on Grief, Orcish Bowmasters, Troll of Khazadum, and Murtide Region as sort of win conditions or threats. Looking at the core of the deck, we have playsets of Troll, Grief, and Reanimate. The rest of the creature suite consists of Orcish Bowmasters, 2-3 copies of Murtide Regent, a Brazen Borrower, and sometimes Douthy Voidwalker as threats with additional utility. Ponder, Brainstorm, and Force of Will are typically 4 ofs. Most or many lists play four copies of Days, but this particular list only has a single copy. There are many options in terms of interaction. This list is playing two copies of Stifle alongside Drown in the Lock, Force of Negation, Fatal Push, and Snuff Out. Other main deck cards I've seen from time to time include Shieldred's Edict, Dismember, Whale of the Forgotten, Animate Dead, and Thoughtseize. Traditionally, these lists also played some form of card advantage like Sauron's Ransom to pull ahead in the long game. This mana base is 16 lands, including 7 blue fetch lands, playsets each of Underground Sea and Wasteland, a pair of basics, an island and a swamp, and a mystic sanctuary. Lists are now sometimes including a copy or two of Undercity Sewers, the new Surveil dual land. I've seen lists go as high as 18 lands with a copy or two of Lorien revealed on top of that. Classic scam sideboards almost always include something like Hydroblast, Surgical Extraction, Dress Down, and Null Rod, the rest is usually a selection of removal and counter spells for specific matchups, along with some utility cards like Plague Engineer or Palantir of Orthanc. In this case, there are two copies of Fatal Push alongside a Plague Engineer, Force of Negation, Narset Parter of Veils, Shieldred's Edict, and Powder Keg. With a wide range of interactive tools and threats, the deck can pivot between proactive and reactive plans as required by the situation. This list, in a similar dynamic to Salt Eye Beans, has a wide range of options that forces opponents to decide what to play around versus play into. Unlike Salt Eye Beans, there's no way to completely outcard the opponent like Up the Beanstalk can. This means that control matchups are typically poor, and we see the deck underperform against Salt Eye and Bant based Beans decks due to their ability to answer all the threats and then outcard Classic Scam in the late game. Grief, Reanimate, and Counter Magic, all backed up by Wastelands, make this deck a nightmare matchup for combo players. Reanimator is a particularly good matchup due to the interaction of allowing the opponent's Entomb effect to resolve, then countering the Reanimate effect, and then casting your own Reanimate to reanimate their payoff. Classic Scam relies on cantrips to find the needed cards, and it has less removal than a control deck. This leaves the deck vulnerable against aggressive Ancient Tomb decks like Turbo Goblins that can cut off many cards with a Chalice of the Void or a Blood Moon, all while applying a lot of pressure. Trinisphere is probably the weakest of these lock pieces against Classic Scam because of the quantity of trolls played. This allows us to ensure that we hit land drops without having to spend 3 mana to ponder or brainstorm in order to try and find lands. Against Grixis Delver, while being less threat dense in the early game, the 4 copies of Reanimate result in a favorable Bowmaster's disparity in Scam's advantage. The deck doesn't have a consistent enough aggressive game to force the opponent into playing into days, which is why I think we only see one copy in this particular list. In classic Scam lists, our options are wide ranging in what threats and answers to play. Traditionally, lists eschewed the Douthies for card advantage, uh, something like Sauron's Ransom, 
which allowed them to have some ability to grind. This has fallen out of favor, but it is still an option. The removal and spell suite also has a high degree of flexibility. Like I mentioned earlier, we see anything from Stifle or Spell Pierce to Drown in the Lock or Murderous Cut. Some players opt to play a third color purely for red or green sideboard cards like Meltdown, Collector Oof, Pyroblast, or Carpet of Flowers. Now that we've explored the base versions of each category, let's explore some of the spicier flavors of the scam decks. We've already covered Reanimator in depth along with most of the variations of that deck, most of the variations are in the sideboard cards and sideboard plans, so we're going to look at the versions of the black-based scam decks and the demir-based scam decks. Each of these versions build on the core concepts and strengths of the underlying archetype, but either add an additional angle of attack, or focus on a specific dynamic to increase consistency and power, or they try and shore up a weakness of the category. Hybrid versions that add an additional dimension are Mono Black Helm, Rakdos Rescaminator, and Golgari Witherbloom Combo Scam. Demir Rescaminator is also a hybrid deck, but it's almost its whole own entire category. The other versions that hone in on a specific focus to improve consistency are Delver Scam and Grixis Delver Scam. Salt Eye Scam is probably the most controlling version of Scam, leading heavily into a late game focus. Hogak Scam and Orzov Scam are both heavily synergistic decks that maximize some aspect of the deck. Rakdos Scam is possibly the most fair Scam deck with card choices to mitigate weaknesses and play a more well-rounded game. We've also got Demir Death Shadow, which is maybe its own category, but it's kind of closest to a Delver Scam deck or a Classic Scam deck. One of the best decks on Magic Online in the past few weeks, Demir Scaminator, is a hybrid deck sort of partway between Classic Scam and Reanimator. Due to its current prevalence, there are a wealth of lists to examine, but we'll look at the list that Bosch and Roll played to a 5th place finish at an SCG Con 5k Legacy event pretty recently. He also has a tournament report on his YouTube channel if you want to hear about his experience with the deck. This deck essentially takes the classic Demir Scam core and swaps out flex slots and some of the creatures for a reanimation package. We have playsets of Brainstorm, Ponder, Force, and Days, sort of as our expected blue package of cantrips and interaction. Playsets of Entomb, Reanimate, and Animate Dead are the center of the reanimation plan, while Animate Dead provides additional consistency for Grief or Troll lines as part of the scam package. The creature suite consists of playsets of Grief and Troll with three copies of Orcish Bowmasters, but some lists play four. To pair with Entomb and Reanimation spells, we see one copy of Archon of Cruelty and one copy of Atraxa Grand Unifier. Due to trying to fit in two disparate strategies into one deck, there isn't much space for removal or flex slots. This list has a single Whale of the Forgotten and one Brazen Borrower. Both of these choices are great in the main deck, being catch-alls to interact with most non-land permanents. Bounce spells also play really well with the Grief Scam Package, because bouncing something troublesome and then discarding it from their hand can be an effective way to answer pretty much anything. The mana base is pretty stock with 7 blue fetch lands, a playset of underground sea, 1 undercity sewers, a pair of basic lands, and 3 copies of wasteland. Some lists play 4. The sideboard contains the beatdown plan we would expect from a classic scam deck, 3 copies of Dalthy Voidwalkers, the 4th Bowmasters in this case, and a second copy of Brazen Borrower. We also see a wide array of interaction to bring in for specific matchups. There are two copies of Force of Negation and Dress Down, along with a Null Rod, a Hydroblast, an Unlicensed Thirst, and a Dismember. The addition of the reanimation package allows the deck to attack on multiple axes while still playing a fair strong game with Disruption, Wastelands, and Bowmasters. Being able to threaten and tomb into reanimate can be difficult for fair decks to play around, especially when sideboarding. This can often result in an opponent overboarding or underboarding depending on what they saw in game 1. Typically in fair blue mirrors, players board out Force of Will as there aren't opposing threats worth spending two cards to answer, and card advantage is typically a higher priority here. But reanimating an Archon or an Atraxa is definitely worth stopping with Force of Will even at the cost of two cards. This is really in tension with the desire to board out Force of Wills. Often how this plays out is that the opponent is forced to keep them in and often board in additional graveyard hate while the Rescaminator player boards out their Force of Wills. This dilutes the opponent's deck and improves Rescaminator's fair plan. 
In fair or pseudo-fair mirrors, this can often become a leveling game where the opponent has to guess which plan is going to be utilized in each post-board game. In over-the-board play or in-person paper play, this is definitely a deck where I am shuffling my entire sideboard into my deck during sideboarding to mask the number of cards I board in and out. Having access to undercity sewers has a pretty big impact basically for free. It can be used to bin Atraxa or Archon when used in combination with Ponder or Brainstorm. This provides additional redundancy to the reanimation plan. Lines involving the Surveil land either involve having it in hand and then playing it after casting a cantrip, or responding to the Surveil trigger with a Brainstorm to put an Atraxa or Archon back on top, which can then be milled once the trigger resolves. The reanimation package can also really help in some of the bad matchups that Classic Scam has. It's a fantastic tool against decks that traditionally prey on fair blue decks, decks like Turbo Goblins, Lands, and non-blue fair-ish decks like Cradle Control. Due to the addition of the reanimation package in this deck, it has increased exposure to graveyard hate, cards like Leyline or Hearse, but it isn't cold to it in the same way that something like Oops All Spells or Reanimator would be. Demira Scaminator isn't a turn one fast deck like Dedicated Reanimator is, so cards like Surgical Extraction and Fair Macabre they're still good, but they are vulnerable to being discarded by grief, while also only being able to hit 1-2 to two cards at a time. This deck has the ability to easily put targets into the graveyard between Entomb, Grief, Troll, and Undercity Sewers. This can overload single target graveyard hate like Surgical Extraction. I think the key cards to play in terms of graveyard hate would be something like Unlicensed Hurst or Leyline of the Void, something that can stay in play and continuously have an effect. Outside of dedicated Graveyard Hate, Exile-based removal and card advantage are both strong against this deck. If you can blank their duplicate reanimation spells with something like Swords to Plowshares, Solitude, or Leyline Binding, that can go a long way to reduce pressure. Being able to recoup card advantage is traditionally one of the best ways to beat discard effects and discard-based decks. Due to these two dynamics, I think there's probably a version of like a Bant Beans deck that's probably quite favored in the matchup. This might also be why we see the Esper Rescaminator lists now, as they can leverage this dynamic in the mirror matches. I really like these Esper lists. The first list I saw was from a pilot Uberdub on Magic Online. Their list was pretty standard, except for the mana base and the sideboard. The primary goal of the White Splash is to gain access to Swords to Plowshares and Triumph of St. Catherine. These are cards that are part of the fair plan in postboard games. To support these white cards, the mana base has been adjusted to include a Scrubland and a Tundra in exchange for two Underground Seas. The fair plan post board in these Esper lists is a playset of Dalthy and three copies each of Swords to Plowshares and Triumph of St. Catherine. I think this plan is excellent. Triumph and Swords are each excellent tools in fair mirrors like Delver. They also have the upside of being able to, for the most part, ignore graveyard hate like Leyline or Surgical Extraction. The White Splash also gives the deck access to other powerful white sideboard cards, cards like Serenity. Obviously, the White Splash comes at a cost of being less stable in terms of its mana base, creating vulnerability to Wasteland or Blood Moon cutting off access to white mana. Whether the White Splash is worth it will be something to keep an eye on. I think the biggest dynamic when playing with or against Demira Scaminator is to play the player across from you. Because the deck has such a high degree of flexibility between pre- and post-board games, there is no real correct sideboard plan or one key card to break the matchup open. You probably want to play this deck if you want to play what is likely the best hybrid deck in Legacy right now. It might even be the best deck in Legacy right now, full stop. Do not play this deck if you don't like sideboard mind games, or you want to rely on simple heuristics when making decisions. Like, if you've got a sideboard guide and you just want to stick to that sideboard guide, this is not going to be the right deck for you. Let's look at the other, unfortunately much worse, Rescaminator deck. Rakdos or Mono Black Rescaminator is like Mono Black Aggro and Reanimator had a baby, or if like Reanimator played the sideboard beatdown package in the main deck. We start our main deck with the small reanimation package in the form of one Atraxa, one Archon, four Entomb, four Reanimate, and two Animate Dead. Next is the less efficient but more versatile enabler, two gummies of Currency Converter. This deck also has a playset of Dark Ritual, which gives it a lot of explosive power. There is a scam and beatdown strategy consisting of full playsets of Grief, Troll, Douthy Voidwalker, and Orcish Bowmasters. There are two copies of Shieldred and one Hogak. The Hogak is interesting because it can be entombed for and then cast via Delve and Convoke. 
Supplementing the two strategies is a playset of Thoughtseize and one Cabal Therapy for disruption, plus a Molten Collapse as removal. Three copies of Urza Saga are the changes in the mana base. These provide an additional angle of attack while finding a currency converter to help grind in the long game. The sideboard contains some powerful red cards, allowing the deck to go fully fair post-board if needed. Fable of the Mirror Breaker and Shadow Spear are fantastic tools in mid-range mirrors. Magus of the Moon is another off-axis threat that can pressure multi-color decks along with land-centric decks like, you know, 12 post or, uh, lands. Similar to Demir Scaminator, the hybrid nature of this deck leads opponents to having difficulty sideboarding due to the tension between how to balance being good against unfair versus fair portions of the deck. Post-board, Graveyard Hate like Rest in Peace and Leyland of the Void are less effective against this deck because there are supplemental threats like Fable of the Mirror Breaker and Magus of the Moon that are not impacted by the graveyard. Lacking selection via cantrips means that the pilot has less agency in how to approach each game. You might draw a reanimator hand or a fair hand, but you're unlikely to be able to pivot away from that if the situation calls for it. The other cost of this deck construction is that it's less stable than its dedicated counterparts in Reanimator and Mono Black Aggro. Drawing the wrong half of the deck is something that can happen, can lead to a failure rate. For example, drawing reanimation spells and no enablers. We've only seen a few non-blue Riskaminator lists succeed since the original top 8 of this deck in Prague, so I think there's a lot of room for adjustment here. This deck could be good if you like the post-board games with Reanimator, where you can attack on multiple angles, pressuring their life total while threatening them with Archon or Atraxa. I would probably avoid this deck if you want to prioritize efficiency and power level over versatility. On the other hand, you know, this deck can be pretty powerful and pretty fun. Yeah, I don't know what this next deck is called, so I'm just going to use every descriptor I can think of. Golgari Witherbloom Apprentice Combo Scam is another hybrid deck that combines Mono Black Aggro Scam with Witherbloom Apprentice and Chain of Smog in sort of this hybrid aggro combo deck. Starting with a the combo, there's a place at each of the AB combo pieces, Witherbloom Apprentice, and Chain of Smog. The scam package is slightly adjusted to include a pair of Generous Ent, the Forest Cycler that conveniently also blocks Delver of Secrets and other small flyers. Orcish Bowmasters is the other primary proactive creature, and there's a pair of One Ring in addition to Sylvan Safekeeper to protect the combo. We see a playset of Thoughtseize as additional disruption, and three copies of Veil of Summer as protection. There's also a Summer's Pact as a fifth copy of Witherbloom Apprentice. This deck has lots of acceleration, there are playsets of Dark Ritual and Lotus Petal, there's even a copy of Elvish Spirit Guide as a ninth piece of Fast Mana. The meta base is six fetches, three Bayou, three Wasteland, an Underground Mortuary, the Black Green Surveil Land, and a pair of basic lands, one swamp, one forest. The sideboard contains a fair plan in two opposition agents and an endurance. These additional threats are supported by a pair of fatal push, a shieldred's edict, one snuff out, two pick your poison, and a veil of summer, all round out these broadly useful sideboard cards. There is also some dedicated graveyard and artifact hate in the form of two surgical extractions, one force of vigor, and a null rod. In the same way as other hybrid decks function, it can be difficult for opposing decks to balance playing a fair game while also playing around the combo. Of all the scam decks we see, this one may be one of the least reliant on the graveyard, meaning that it has the ability to much more easily ignore something like Leyline or other graveyard hate. This deck is extremely powerful and fast with a significant amount of interaction to protect the combo. It definitely skews closer to the combo end of the spectrum and likely does not have the mid-range game to win a fair creature mirror without the combo. The fast mana is a big contributor to this dynamic as the deck has 24 mana sources outside of the land cyclers, which do have additional utility with reanimate, but in total brings the total sort of like mana sources up to 29. Combined, this is almost half the deck, being mana in some form or another, potentially leading to situations where flooding is a significant possibility. This deck is much more all-in than some of its relatives due to the quantity of fast mana, meaning that mulligan decisions and early sequencing are likely the most important decisions to make when playing this deck. Because of this, if the opponent can survive the initial wave, it's likely going to be pretty hard to rebuild without drawing a one ring. The beatdown plan is solid with... Bowmasters, Grief, and Troll or Ent, but Witherbloom Apprentice is a notable downgrade from Dalthy if, you know, obviously, a Chain of Smog cannot be found. This deck has lots of tools to beat Counter Magic between Grief, Thoughtseize, and Veil of Summer. 
Veil of Summer is also great against the black removal spells and opposing discard. It's not a popular deck, so I haven't really played with or against it yet. This deck seems like it's a more powerful but less mana efficient and less consistent than Reanimator, but it does dodge a lot of the graveyard hate that, you know, obviously hits Reanimator. My first impression is that this is more of a metagame choice than a deck that is likely to have a lasting impact or staying power. I think the other possible flex slots to play around with might be something like the Sylvan Safekeeper, Elvish Spirit Guide, Summoner's Pact, and, and maybe even the One Ring, but I'm not sure about that one. This deck can be good if the scam combo decks are your preference, but there's a lot of graveyard hate in your metagame. I would avoid this deck if you hate having to mulligan aggressively. This deck is a very high density of fast mana, which means that you're likely going to see a lot more mulligans. Mono Black Helm is the final hybrid combo scam deck that we see in the metagame right now. The Helm combo of this deck combines Helm of Obedience with either Leyline of the Void or Dalthy Voidwalker that mills out the entire opponent's library. Currently, the deck plays Karn as extra copies of Helm, and these combo pieces are supported by Disruptive Threats, the same ones that we see from Mono Black Aggro Scam. Here's a current list of Mono Black Helm. It looks pretty similar to Mono Black Aggro, with a creature package including the Scam core of Grief, Reanimate, and Troll. Orcish Bowmasters and Opposition Agent disrupt and apply pressure. Playset of Dalthy Voidwalkers along with 3 Helm of Obedience, 4 Karn the Great Creator, and 4 Leyline of the Void represent the combo elements of this deck. Chrome Mox and Dark Ritual provide acceleration to power out threats and combo pieces. The mana base is based on soul lands to play cards ahead of Curve, supported by a pair of Urborg, three swamps, and a Takanuma. Agadim's Awakening is functionally a swamp that can be pitched to Chrome Mox. This sideboard has a wide range of silver bullets to wish for with Karn. Mono Black Helm has the advantage of being a redundant combo deck with lots of main deck graveyard hate, while also having proactive threats that encumber the opponent. The downsides are that it is reliant on draw texture and does not have access to removal spells or selection, and is one of the least mana efficient combos available in Legacy. Life total management is really important with this deck. Between Agadim's Awakening, Ancient Tomb, and Reanimate, players may need to maximize the use of each point of life to cast spells without dying. Obviously, the main deck contains playsets of Leyland of the Void and Dalthy, providing a high degree of disruption for opposing graveyard decks. This is incidental but effective hate against opposing scam decks, not to mention archetypes like Reanimator, Dredge, and to a lesser extent, Beseech Storm decks with Gaia's Will, and decks like Lands with Life from the Loam. There is a dynamic where the deck is always threatening a kill when there's a Leyland or a Dalthy in play. This can lead opponents to being incentivized to interact with the A plus B combo instead of the onboard pressure in the form of Orcish Bowmasters and Opposition Agent. The deck lacks meaningful interaction outside of the creature lock pieces and the Karn wishboard. This leads to weaknesses against decks like Delver and Turbo Goblins. If you want to play a scam deck with a wishboard and a combo package, this could be the right deck for you. It's also great if you want to destroy graveyard decks with 8 main deck Leyland effects. If you've got a local dredge player and you just are tired of them, eh, this could be a good deck. It's probably not a great choice for players who like interactive decks. I first saw Delver Scam in mid-January, and at the time lumped it in with Classic Scam. This is a deck that focuses on one dynamic of Classic Scam, and attempts to be much better on that specific angle. It's only 6-8 to eight cards different from Classic Scam, but it feels like a drastically different deck. We start with the same core cards and make a small number of swaps to drastically change the play patterns and matchup dynamics. The scam package contributes to the deck on multiple angles. Troll enables a lower land count while Grief and Reanimate provide disruption and aggression. Delver, Stalactite Stalker, and Orcish Bowmasters provide aggressive mana efficient threats. One self-respecting Delver deck doesn't play at least a couple copies of Murktide Regent. We see this standard blue package of Brainstorm, Ponder, Force, and Daze to provide selection and interaction. The removal suite is on the lighter end, with two copies of Snuff Out and two copies of Fatal Push. Due to the lower curve and Troll of Kazadoom, the deck is able to play a lower land count, while still fitting in two basic lands and a playset of Wastelands. The sideboard remains mostly the same as what we'd see in Classic Scam, with narrow and powerful tools for specific matchups. The addition of Delver and or Stalactite Stalker makes this deck much more consistent in its aggressive draws, especially compared to Classic Scam. 
Mana efficiency is the name of the game here, with every card in the main deck costing 0 to 1 mana except for Orcish Spellmasters, Murktide Regent, and I guess Hardcast Grief. I don't envision this deck ever really having 6 mana to cast Troll of Cause of Doom. Fatal Push, Snuff Out, Force, and Daze are the most mana efficient interactive spells available. As a result of lowering the curve and including these cheap additional threats, Delver Scam is a much better Wasteland Daze deck than many of its other Demir Scam counterparts possibly with the exception of Demira Scaminator. The cost of lowering the curve and increasing threat density means that this deck is no longer able to effectively operate on multiple axes quite as effectively as some of its counterparts. It can still decide to be a control deck or the beatdown deck, but it's much more likely to take on the role of beatdown. Having access to an additional 8 proactive turn 1 plays gives the deck a lot more game against combo and ancient tomb decks. Initiative is a lot less popular than it once was, but being able to contest the board and trade damage goes a long way in that particular matchup. Presenting a clock is an essential component of beating Turbo Goblins and Moonstompy as well. The deck building choices to be made consist of what interaction to play and which threats to play. Deciding what split of Delver, Stalker, and Dothy to play is one of the big decisions. Recently players have moved away from Stalactite, Stalker, and Dothy, opting for more removal and interaction in the main deck. Obviously, this compromises some of those aggressive draws. Some players opt to play other interaction like Spell Pierce, Whale of the Forgotten, Force of Negation, or Drown of the Lock instead of some amount of removal. This deck is great if you like the aggressive play patterns of Scam. It's probably not so great if you want to take on the Control role. Speaking of the Control role, this Salt Dice Scam deck trades away some of the early game for longer game engines in Uro and Witherbloom Command in addition to more interaction. I think this deck was originally pioneered by Pokemoki, as this list is the first one I could find, but it has also seen significant success in recent weeks. The creatures and threats played are playsets of Grief, Reanimate, and Orcish Bowmasters. We see two copies of Troll and two copies of Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. We see the full Cantrip Suite and a copy of Lorien Revealed for selection and ensuring that we hit land drops. In addition to Lorien Revealed, we also see one Sauron's Ransom to provide some extra card advantage in the long game. Traditional interaction consists of two Fatal Push, two Shielded's Edict, and a playset of Force of Will. Drawing inspiration from their Salt Eye Beans deck, Pokemoki plays a 2-2 split of Daze and Stifle to keep the opponents guessing, forcing them to decide which one to play around. The last main deck inclusion is three copies of Witherbloom Command, which has a high degree of versatility and can interact with almost every deck in the format. It's often also card advantage. The mana base is similar to Classic Scam, but with two Tropical Islands and a Bayou as green sources, needing to support green, green, blue, blue for Uro. In the sideboard, we see some of the same cards that we would see in a Classic Scam list, but with the addition of powerful green cards. Hydroblast, Spellbomb, Veil of Summer, and Surgical are all highly efficient interaction for specific strategies. Then there are some broadly powerful tools like Leovold, Pernicious Deed, and Dressdown. Rounding out the rest of the sideboard, there is a Carpet of Flowers, a Dismember, a Powder Keg, and both Force of Vigor and Despair. This deck takes the opposite approach that the Delver Scam decks do. It's extremely powerful in the long game. Uro and Witherbloom Command, in addition to Lorien Revealed and Sauron's Ransom, provide significant amounts of card advantage as the game progresses. There's a pretty reasonable degree of synergy here, with Witherbloom Command filling the graveyard for Uro and potential reanimation targets. Witherbloom Command is a very powerful and versatile card. It's a choose two card with four modes. The first mode mills a player for three, and then you return a land from graveyard to hand. The second mode destroys a non-land, non-creature with mana value two or less. The third mode gives a creature minus three minus one, and the fourth mode drains the opponent for two life. The combination of two of these effects is typically worth one and a half to two cards, meaning that Witherbloom Command is often going to be a two mana divination. It answers a wide range of cards from Orcish Bowmasters to Chalice the Void or Beanstalk all in one while providing card advantage. This list also has a wide array of interactive options to ensure that these card advantage engines have time to come online. Having access to green increases the power level of available sideboard cards, shoring up many of the poor matchups. The downsides of this list are primarily a result of being a more controlling 3-color deck. Being 3 colors means that the mana base is slightly less stable in producing all the colored mana needed, and Blood Moon might be highly effective. 
The other downside is that this shift towards a more controlling style comes at the cost of being less threat dense and having fewer aggressive draws. As with other scam decks, there is a degree of vulnerability to graveyard interaction. This is especially true here, as Uro almost always has to spend a turn in the graveyard before being escaped into play. This deck has some real card advantage engines, and it is likely favored in many fair blue mirrors. It is able to interact with and disrupt the opponent on many different axes. Removing the faster threats means that this deck doesn't really have a nut draw, so to speak, and every victory will be grindy and skill testing. In terms of card choices and flex slots, I don't know if there's a lot to play around with. In the main deck, you could probably play around with quantities of Stifle, Daze, Fatal Push, and Shieldred's Edict, but I do really like how well-rounded that selection is. Out of the sideboard, there's a wealth of options to attack any specific matchup, so if there's something that you find difficult, you can add an extra couple sideboard cards for just that matchup. I think this is ideal for disciplined blue mid-range and control players, and it may not be the right choice if you just enjoy jamming threats. Going back to the more aggressive end of the spectrum, Grixis Delver Scam is very similar to Delver Scam, but it trades off some consistency and the basic lands for Dragon's Rage Channeler, Lightning Bolt, and Molten Collapse. This list is from Jake TMS, who went 3-1 in a prelim. The deck manages to fit most of the Grixis Delver Shell and most of the Demir Scam Core, both of those packages into one single deck. We see the scam package of Troll, Grief, and Reanimate. This package is backed up by Delver, DRC, and Orcish Bowmasters. Of course, we see the playsets of Brainstorm, Ponder, Force, and Daze. This particular player opted for six removal spells with a range of efficiencies and flexibility. Two Lightning Bolt, two Snuff Out, and two Molten Collapse. The mana base is only 14 lands supplemented by the playset of Trolls. Two Volcanics and a Badlands are the red sources. Notably, there are no basic lands, which does increase vulnerability to Wasteland when compared to the other Demir decks. In the sideboard, we see a few high-impact red cards in addition to the standard Demir Fair. Red Blasts and Meltdown are both extremely potent, efficient cards at attacking either blue spells or artifacts. Price of Progress is a great way to pressure the more controlling decks, often dealing 6 or 8 damage in one go. Blue Blasts, Force of Negation, Surgical Extraction, and Null Rod are sort of to be expected in this kind of a sideboard. This deck takes ideas from the Demir Delver Scam deck and dials it up to the next degree. Getting on board quickly and applying multiple types of pressure via Scam or Delver-style draws gives this deck an incredible early game. Similar to other Delver-style decks, this list is super low to the ground, powering up Days and Wasteland to a degree that is pretty hard to match. Snuff Out is one of the most efficient playable removal spells, which supplements this same plan. I think it's hard to overstate the power of Dragon's Rage Channeler and Scam decks. It's an efficient threat which plays nicely with the rest of the game plan, but it also provides incidental card selection, which helps a lot to prevent flooding out in the mid-game. I'll revisit this in a little bit when we look at another deck later. Comparatively, this deck has a higher ceiling than I think the Demir Delver Scam list does, with a wider selection of tools. I'm not sure if this is a deck for me in the long term, but it's certainly a strong choice if you want to play the most aggressive possible blue scam deck. It may though not be a good choice if you prefer stability over power level. Orzov Scam is maybe the most scam-focused scam deck in Legacy. There's a real major focus on leveraging grief via scam effects in this deck. Matthias Hardstyle has been the primary pilot of this particular deck, achieving several 5-0 league results. This deck shares a lot of cards with Mono Black Aggro Scam. We start with a pair of trolls and playsets of Grief and Reanimate. The remaining creature threats are playsets of Dalfi Voidwalkers, Orcish Bowmasters, Opposition Agent, and a pair of Shieldred the Apocalypse. Dark Ritual and Ephemerate both serve as acceleration, with Dark Ritual being a familiar tool to power out Bowmaster or Opposition Agent, and Ephemerate allowing for additional turn 1 scam hands. The deck plays three copies of Thoughtseize as additional disruption, and there's a playset of Swords to Plowshares with three copies of Touch of the Spirit Realm as removal. In addition to being removal, Touch of the Spirit Realm enables additional scam hands at a slightly less efficient 2 mana invested. The mana base includes some fetch lands, playsets of Scrubland and Wasteland, four basic lands, and a copy of Caracas as a hybrid white source and utility land. In the sideboard, we see some additional creatures, two copies each of Plague Engineer, Torak, Dread Cantor, and Solitude. Going pretty heavy on Graveyard Hate, there's a playset of Surgical Extraction. We also see two copies of Serenity and Void Mirror, in addition to a single copy of Null Rod. 
Supporting Reanimate, Ephemerate, and Touch the Spirit Realm both enable a larger number of scam hands, providing a total of 11 scam effects. This massively increases the likelihood of cheating a grief into play. White removal spells are a big upgrade in this deck, allowing it to more easily beat an opposing troll or murktide while also having utility against cards like Uro. Krakas is also basically a free slot that can be very good against some matchups and in some situations. The downsides of a list like this are that it's got less consistent mana than its mono black cousin, with some added vulnerability to wasteland and blood moon effects. In the same vein as mono black aggro, the deck does not have any filtering or selection in the long game. Especially when paired with fast mana in Dark Ritual, the deck does have a reasonable chance of flooding out. With a greater focus on grief via Ephemerate and Touch of the Spirit Realm, the deck loses some of the explosive power when it doesn't draw grief. This list is heavily synergistic. While I haven't played it, my initial thought is that these synergies empower a higher power level ceiling, but may have a higher failure rate if the deck is unable to find grief. Ephemerate adds additional utility, being able to blink grief in the opponent's draw step or otherwise rebuy some enter the battlefield abilities. It can also function as a 2 for 1 or a 3 for 1 when used to blank a removal spell. Solitude out of the sideboard shares all of these lines when played against creature decks. I think this deck likely has a similar matchup spread to Mono Black, but with significantly better creature matchups. The options when looking at an Orzhov scam deck come down to how deep into white you want to go. I did see another list that 5 would that had a playset of Staff of the Storyteller and a Stoneforge Mystic package with Cauldra and Jite. A list like that likely has an even higher power level, but that does come at some of the explosiveness and some mana based stability. If you want to get them dead and go all in on grief, but you don't want to lose to creature decks, this might be a good choice for you. It's likely a poor choice if you don't want to be disciplined with your mulligan decisions or are frustrated by drawing situational cards like Ephemerate. Death Shadow has gone through many iterations in Legacy, and predates the printing of the scam package. Since then though, the deck has evolved to be pretty similar to the Delver scam lists, focusing on mana efficiency. The scam package is similar, but notably different from the other decks we've looked at today. We don't have any troll, so Street Wraith serves the same role in combination with Reanimate while having the upside of being synergistic with Death Shadow. There are three copies of Grief and a playset of Reanimate. Of course, you couldn't play Death Shadow without a playset of Death Shadow, it's the namesake card. We also see a playset of Stalactite Stalkers, three copies of Orgish Bowmasters, and two Murktide Regents. These function as the threat suite for the deck, providing some degree of aggression before the Death Shadow comes online. There are the expected playsets of Brainstorm, Ponder, Force, and Daze. One Brazen Borrower and two copies of Snuff Out serve as the interaction for creatures and other onboard threats. The mana base is a little different, it's comprised of three Watery Graves, two Underground Sea, eight Blue Fetches, and a playset of Wasteland. Watery Grave is important for enabling Death Shadow against decks that don't pressure life totals, like control decks or some combo decks. This sideboard rounds out the threat package with a playset of Dalthy Voidwalker alongside an additional copy of Brazen Borrower and an additional copy of Orcish Bowmasters. There is some additional removal and broad sideboard cards in Shieldred's Edict, a pair of Fatal Push, a Dress Down, and a Basic Swamp for matchups where Blood Moon or Wasteland are of particular concern. The rest of the board consists of a narrow but high impact selection of cards, Hydroblast, Spellbomb, Null Rod, and Powder Keg. Beyond the obvious budget benefits, there are some other upsides to playing Death Shadow. Death Shadow is a card that can be difficult to play against as it can unexpectedly grow from a Street Wraith during mid-combat. With only 4 reanimates and a pair of Murktide Regent, this deck is one of the most resilient versions of the Demir Scam decks against Graveyard Hate. Despite being a giant and mana efficient threat late in the game, Death Shadow can be kinda clunky with the Street Wraiths and Shocklands. These cards are independently not really powerful enough to play in a fair legacy deck and only really serve to empower Death Shadow specifically. Death Shadow is also pretty hard to cast until a few turns into the game, barring some specific draws with a lot of Street Wraiths. Chalice the Void has particular efficacy against this deck as it has a much greater emphasis on 1-drops, especially one that can't be frequently cast on turn 1, so cast underneath of a Chalice. Swords to Plowshares is also awkward, it's often a 2 or more for 1 against multiple copies of Death Shadow in play. Unlike the Delver variants, Death Shadow is often more about trading cards and then having a big Death Shadow after the dust settles to close the game. Your life total is a resource, and managing it is much more complex here as we both need to reduce it below 13 without being so low as to be in danger of dying. 
This gets really interesting when playing against Lightning Bolt decks, and it's often great at racing because taking damage from opposing creatures grows shadows to often crack back for lethal. Against control decks and combo decks that don't pressure the life total, can take some time to get shadow online though. Shadow players, uh, feel free to get salty in the comments, but I, I don't really think this deck is it. I don't think the benefits of shadow outweigh the downsides of shock lands unless you're on a budget, and this is what you can afford to build. If you are constrained by a budget, Death Shadow is ideal for winning the ground game in Creature Mirrors, and it's a powerful classic legacy style Xerox deck at a fraction of the cost for any similar deck. If that sounds attractive, it might be a good fit. At the end of the day, playing legacy on a budget is much better than not playing legacy at all, so feel no shame and jam some shadow. It's a perfectly competitive deck, and your play skill can more than overcome any downsides from playing shock lands. Looking at another black based scam deck, Rakdos Scam is a take on mono black aggro scam that drops Dark Ritual, Opposition Agent, Shieldred, and trims some of the removal spells for a Dragon's Rage Channeler, Mishra's Bauble Package, and Red Removal. This deck has a slightly adjusted scam package with only 3 trolls, 4 grief, and the playset of Reanimate, but there's a single animate dead. Dragon's Rage Channeler and Stalactite Stalker are each some of the best one drops in Rakdos colors. They are efficient and each provide additional utility. Three copies each of Dalthy Voidwalker and Orcish Bowmasters have powerful utility effects while clocking the opponent. We have some additional interaction in the form of Lightning Bolt, Thought Seize, Molten Collapse, Seal of Fire, Shieldred's Edict, and Snuff Out. Closing out, we've got four Mishra's Bauble and one Lotus Petal. Mishra's Bauble does a surprising amount here. It functions as a pseudo cantrip when combined with DRC or fetch lands, it's an extra card type for delirium, and it can trigger descend for stalactite stalker. The one of Lotus Petal is interesting. It's fast mana that can be played out proactively with Dragon's Rage Channel in play to get a surveil trigger. Sometimes it just gives the deck a little bit of extra early game speed. In the sideboard, there's Surgical Extraction, Fairy Macabre, Force of Despair, and then some big red blowouts in Meltdown and Blood Moon or Magus of the Moon. There's also a couple copies of Pyroblast or Red Blast. I think this deck has a lot of upsides when compared to Mono Black Aggro. It's consistent and aggressive. Dragon's Rage Channeler with Mishra's Bauble and Fetches gives us zero mana card selection, so it's almost like the deck gets to play a bunch of Considers without having to play any blue mana. Red Removal is fantastic in this deck, both Molten Collapse is a versatile and powerful spell, and Lightning Bolt, which adds a whole new dimension in regards to being able to burn the opponent out. As a two-color deck, the mana base is a little bit more vulnerable to Wastelands, but as long as a basic swamp can be found, there is very minimal exposure to Blood Moon effects. This version definitely doesn't have the same explosive power that the mono black version can present via Dark Ritual into Opposition Agent or Bowmasters, but it is significantly more consistent and still has some nut draws. Overall, I like the deck because it's more stable and has stronger interaction than the mono black versions. Some lists go much deeper on red, including cards like Broadside Bombardiers, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, and sometimes even Fury. The other change I sometimes see is whether or not to include fast mana. Lotus Petal is often the accelerant of choice when playing Dragon's Rage Channeler because it can be played when selection is needed instead of when the mana is needed. Dark Ritual doesn't have this same kind of optionality. Chromox is also something that I guess could be considered in this deck. Having access to red sideboard cards is also a pretty big deal. Blood Moon, Meltdown, and Pyroblast are all really high impact cards in specific matchups. I think this deck is pretty good if you want to get the opponent dead, but still want to have a wide variety of interactive spells and a higher level of stability, eking out small advantages in a non-blue deck. I probably wouldn't recommend this deck if you don't like to play on a Razor's Edge with small creatures, or if you want to be able to go big, or if you like playing, you know, actual cantrips. We're going to close on maybe one of the spiciest Demir Scam decks, Hogak Scam. Hogak Scam relies on Hogak as the top end instead of Murktide Regent. Hogak requires a significant amount of support to be able to cast, but it's got huge upsides. We see the standard scam package, Troll, Grief, and Reanimate. The other creatures are Stitcher Supplier, which supports Hogak, for Orcish Bowmasters, and a playset of Hogak as the beefy top end. As expected, we've got playsets of Brainstorm, Ponder, Force, and Daze. The removal and interaction suite is a little on the light end with two Cabal Therapy and three copies of Snuff Out. Dryad Arbor is an interesting addition to the mana base, as it helps to cast Hogak from the graveyard. To support Dryad Arbor, we see seven green fetch lands, and there are no polluted deltas in this deck. The rest of the mana base is a playset of Underground Seas, a single Swamp, and a pair of Wastelands. The sideboard has many cards we would expect from a demir based scam deck, with spare copies of Wasteland and Cabal Therapy for matchups where they're good. I think the biggest upside to this deck is how powerful Hogak is. 
It wins almost any ground game, and it can be repeatedly cast from the graveyard. With a high level of synergy, this deck has a level of consistency that I think is going to be hard to match. This is a much more graveyard-oriented deck than some of the other scam decks though, opening itself up to heightened levels of vulnerability to effects like Leyland of the Void, Dothy Voidwalkers, and Surgical Extraction. I am especially concerned with the fact that a single Surgical Extraction can exile all four Hogax, leaving the deck with no top end. It also doesn't have any answers to permanent pieces of graveyard hate outside of Powder Keg, which can be pretty slow. This deck compromises on its quality and quantity of interaction, resulting in a slightly lower level of survivability. Flyers are also a potential vulnerability for this deck. Murktide Region often fills an important role for Demir Scam decks in establishing air supremacy or in contesting opposing Murktide Regions. This deck is somewhat linear and attempts to execute its game plan to kill the opponent, but it may have difficulty playing the control role against some combo decks or those decks with flyers. Control decks may have difficulty managing Hogak, but Exile-based removal winds up quite well, so white-based Beans decks likely have a pretty good matchup here. Due to how much of the deck is required to support Hogak, there aren't that many flex slots to play around with. I would definitely look at some sideboard cards that can more efficiently interact with opposing graveyard hate. Bounce spells like Brazen Borrower or Whale of the Forgotten interact really well with Cabal Therapy, bouncing a relevant card and then naming it with Therapy. This deck is powerful and synergistic. If you miss Hogak Summer and Modern, if you're like the one person, maybe this deck can scratch an itch for you. It's probably not a great call right now though, because it'll get hit by all the splash hate that players are packing for Demir Scaminator. No matter what flavor of scam you encounter or play, there are some key components to remember. Grief is not that powerful on its own, it's not really worth evoking without reanimate, animate dead, or ephemerate. If you end up in a situation where you might have a grief in hand and no reanimate, consider if it's worth waiting to cast it for 4 mana instead of just evoking it. Remember, it does have an alternate casting cost of 2 black black. Playing against Scam, it's important to remember that prior to the use of a Scam effect, evoking Grief is card disadvantage. Because of this, it's usually not correct to Force of Will Grief when it's evoked, unless there's a specific card in your hand that must be protected for a combo, or if you have another answer for the reanimate, or you just have to dodge the reanimate in order to win. Sometimes that's your only option, you just gotta dodge reanimate. I think reanimate's actually the glue that holds these decks together, and it's quietly the most important card. Reanimate's an extremely potent card in fair decks, both by enabling powerful plays with grief and troll, but also by being redundant copies of cards already in the graveyard. Orcish Bowmaster mirror matches have this dynamic where the person with the last Bowmaster standing often wins the game. Because Bowmasters, 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 there's a tension where you want to wait until you can Bowmaster their Bowmasters. All this Bowmastering is going on at the same time as each player is hoping to resolve theirs in response to a brainstorm. Reanimate breaks this Bowmaster's tension in an important way. If playing against Salt Eye Beans or Grixis Delver, the opponent has a playset of Bowmasters, but a Scam deck functionally has 8 copies or more of Bowmasters due to Reanimate and Animate Deads. Due to mana efficient combinations of cards, Scam will often have an advantage in the early game, but it may not be able to compete effectively in a longer game if the opponent can pull ahead with card advantage. If Beans, especially of the Bant variety, stabilize, they're going to be very favored as the game progresses. I don't think Scam is going anywhere, it's a powerful engine that supports many distinct decks. Demira Scaminator might be the best deck in Legacy right now, especially with the newer white splash that allows them to mitigate graveyard hate. I think we're going to have to wait and see how the metagame progresses, but I do definitely think that deck is beatable. Grixis Delver and Bant Beans are both likely favored in the matchup. Beating Rescaminator is a leveling game, where each player tries to guess how the other one will sideboard and then board accordingly to blank that plan. This means that it's a particularly skill-testing deck to both play with and against. The other scam decks I like the most are the Grixis or Demir Delver scam decks, Salt Eye Scam, as these decks all focus at being really good at one game plan, and they all truly succeed at it. I think Classic Scam is outdated, it just doesn't have the same power level as some of these other versions. If you want to play a scam deck without blue, I really like the Rakdos scam deck. Mono Black and Orzov scam are both excellent if Rakdos isn't aggressive enough for your tastes. The Hogak Scam decks and non-blue Rescaminator decks are both powerful, but they are more likely to be hit by a graveyard hate directed at Demir Rescaminator. Dedicated Reanimator has fallen off in popularity as Demir Rescaminator is basically doing everything it can do, but better, especially after sideboards. Hopefully, this has helped you to identify what flavor of scam your opponent's playing or which one you want to play. While I didn't go through each matchup of each scam deck, hopefully this breakdown helps you to understand how each of these decks has their own bottlenecks and weaknesses to be attacked, or how best to leverage the advantages that they each have. 
you enjoyed this breakdown and are curious about the state of legacy week by week, check out my playlist, Last Week in Legacy, and subscribe if you want to see more of my work as I make it. Thanks for spending this time with me, and stay scammy.